next speaker. And um, I'm the director of the Computational Biology Center here at BTI, and I'm also a research associate. And I'll be talking about um, some reference genomes that we've generated for non-model plant species using Oxford nanopore technology. And I realize um, my picture is maybe not ideal because I'm going to talk about non-models and I'm showing tomatoes, which are, you know, probably a model. Um, but I'm actually going to talk about the wild species of tomato. Um, and I just find the cultivated variety maybe a little bit more aesthetically appealing for this purpose. So these are actually some heirloom tomatoes from my garden two years ago. Um, and we need some blue tomatoes, clearly, <laughs> so I can finish my rainbow. Um, so before I get into the research aspect of things, I just wanted to give a little blurb about the BTI Computational Biology Center here at BTI. Um, so some of the things we do is we offer courses. We do a bioinformatics course in the spring and also for the summer interns. Um, we organize symposiums and workshops such as this one. Um, we also have uh, office hour that's on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 1 until 2 p.m. Uh, that you're all welcome to attend to ask questions related to bioinformatics. And we are getting a bit of experience with nanopore now, so if you have questions, um, about the bioinformatics side of Nanopore, please feel free to stop by and see us. Um, it's open for all. We also, um, for those, those of you at BTI, we do have uh, a min ion setup um, that you're welcome to use if you're interested. And we have hardware as well um, with, at BTI to do the base calling. So we have a GPU and we also have servers um, for doing data analysis and assembly. So if you're interested in those things, please contact me. Um, and we also do, we're a small group, but we do offer um, data analysis for a fee if you're interested in that. Um, okay, so on to the research. So why are we, why is our group using Nanopore? So some of the things that we're doing right now, um, we're looking to improve some genomes. So we know there's a lot of assemblies out there that were performed using older technologies. Um, that maybe aren't quite as good whenever you're looking at things such as um, synteny between genomes or looking at structural variation um, and that sort of work. So that's, that's one of our, um, our goals. We're also doing a lot of de novo assemblies, so non-reference, things that have never been sequenced before. Um, so a good example of that would be these two purple flowers here. Um, the one on the left is Iachroma cyanium. Um, so this is a collaboration with Stacy Smith at Colorado State. Um, and then we're also um, looking at uh, monkshood, aconitum, with a variety of collaborators. Um, so these are kind of weird non-model systems. Uh, to start with, though, I'll be, I'll be focusing mainly on uh, these two tomato species. So one is a pimpinella folium, and the other um, is actually an introgression line of cultivated tomato. The introgression is coming from like a persicoides. So that um, picture on the right is actually like a persicoides. Uh, and we're also interested in structural variation as it relates to disease resistance since we collaborate very closely with Greg Martin's group. So I know you just heard a bit about tomato. I'm going to give you a little background about the wild species. So there are 13 species in the, the tomato clade. Um, and you can see some of the different wild species here. Um, and they're found mainly in Peru and Ecuador. There are two species that are found on the Galapagos Islands. Um, and they're all pretty closely related. They have uh, a nice variety of phenotypes, so there's much more diversity in the wild species than in cultivated tomato. Um, cultivated tomato went through a number of bottlenecks, and you can see here um, the differences between leaf phenotype, um, there's different fruit colors, so the cultivated tomato is red, Pimpinella folium is red. There the two orange species are the two that are found on the Galapagos Islands, and then the remainder of them are green, um, and probably not something that you would really want to eat so much. So you can just see some of the diversity um, in fruit and leaves here. So the nice thing, since uh, they're all fairly closely related, is you can, with varying degrees of difficulty, um, cross the wild species to the cultivated variety. Uh, so this happens both intentionally and in the wild, um, where their distributions overlap. And as I mentioned, tomato's gone through three bottlenecks. So the cultivated tomato, a lot of the diversity uh, has been lost there. So it's nice that we can use the wild species to bring in some of that, that um, diversity that's been lost through the bottlenecks. Uh, and then you can see in the cultivated tomato, fruit looks 
pretty different, um, but it's just a few number of genes that actually lead um, to these many different fruit phenotypes. And again, I have to show off some heirlooms from my garden. Um, so, wild species in breeding. So they've been used pretty extensively in breeding to in reintroduce some of that lost diversity. Um, what we're specifically interested in often is disease resistance in many of our projects. Um, but they're also used in um, improving fruit quality and nutrition and also uh, things like flowering time and leaf morphology. And what we see in this picture here is, uh, uh, so it's called GH13. It's a variety from one of our collaborators. Um, and you can see um, how it actually has resistance to tomato yellow leaf curl. Um, so it's the nice green happy one in the back and the one in the front is not resistant and very unhappy. So our goals, um, for the tomato projects are to create annotated reference genomes um, for these two accessions that are involved in some of our mapping populations. And you might ask, well, you have a tomato reference genome. Why do you need more? Uh, well, we know that resistance genes are often rapidly evolving, um, and they often in, in, um, evolve due to presence and absence. So you can have duplications that occur in one species but not the other. And those genes can, you know, maybe that novel gene is something that's not captured in the reference. So you're not going to be able to detect information on that gene if it's not found in the reference. And I just cite um, a pan genome paper that recently came out of the Fay lab here, um, and they, where they looked and found that these resistance genes often are um, evolving rapidly due to presence and absence polymorphisms. Uh, so, in keeping with this theme, we want to look at the structural variation um, to detect some of these presence-absence phenotypes that might be linked to genes that are involved in resistance. So here's our general assembly pipeline, which I guess after various talks today shouldn't be too shocking. Uh, again, the two genomes that I'm talking about uh, at this moment is LA1589, which is a Pimpinella folium and also LA4277, which is again an introgression line uh, containing parts of the Lycopersicoides genome. So we've sequenced these at varying depths. Each one is at least at 20x nanopore and 20x alumina. Then we assembled with Maserka, which you just heard about um, in Mike's talk. Then we did some scaffolding with the Ragu, again, Mike's talk. Uh, we did some gap filling with LR gap closer. We polished with pylon. And then we're working to annotate these right now. And anyone that's ever done genome annotation knows that that can be a little bit of a process too. <clears throat> so this is what our data, this is our raw data. Um, and so for LA1589, um, this is, this is uh, three flow cells that we did on the minion. And then we also, um, Zach Lippmann uh, was kind enough to let us use some of the data that they had generated from the Promethean. So I think that might be why um, there's, you know, quite a bit more difference, uh, a, lot more, a lot more data for the LA1589 and longer read length. The LA4277 was just one flow cell, I believe, um, so not as much data there. Um, and you can see the read length wasn't, wasn't quite as long as that one. But considering the tomato genome is less than one gigabase, um, this, this was enough for us to get what, what we were after. Um, so these are some different assemblies that we've done. The Lycopersicoides was using PacBio, so up until probably the last year, most of the genomes that we were involved with were PacBio, but now we've started incorporating the nanopore. So you can see um, a little bit of a difference um, between the Lycopersicoides. It's also very heterozygous, so that's another thing to keep in mind when you look at the Contig N50. It's not particularly great. Um, it's a self-incompatible species, so you would expect it to be very heterozygous, and it is indeed. Um, then we have Lycopersicum, Lycopersicum, so this is a standard Heinz reference genome. Um, <coughs> anyone that works on tomatoes is probably familiar with. Uh, and then we have our two Nanopore Maserka um, Illumina assemblies. Uh, Busco, so just looking at um, single universal um, copy genes, so these genes should be present in the genome, uh, one copy, one time and looking at the same for accessions that were on the previous slide. So again, you can see um, this big green peak under duplicated for Lycopersicoides that is essentially haplotypes that we assembled um, since it's a very heterozygous genome. 
And I should say too, the LEA 1589, I don't think this was the final version, so it wasn't polished yet. So you do see that there's a bit more missing in that one, but I find that this generally improves after the, after the polishing. Okay, so our next steps are to annotate these genomes, specifically because we want to look for um, genes that may be involved in novel resistance phenotypes. Um, looking for structural variation, um, so similar to, to um, the work that Mike just talked about, only linking that to genes that are involved in disease response. Uh, and then what we're really interested in is, as I said, these accessions are being used um, in mapping some of these genes. So we want to use those as references in our bulk segregate analysis and also look to see at, um, if the 4277 has any additional introgressions. We know that there um, is a large one on chromosome 4, but there might be some other little blips throughout the genome. So we'll be, we'll be investigating that. All right, so that's it for tomato. Um, the other projects that we're using Nanopore on right now, and these are sort of in the beginning stages, so I don't have a whole lot to say about them, but Apparently, we have a strong interest in pretty purple flowers in our group. Um, so, as I mentioned at the beginning, these are, these are two of the projects we're working on. And uh, I'll elaborate a bit more about the aconitum. Uh, Adrian, who's going to speak after me, is going to talk about beech. So, these are um, some beech trees in the, in the back here um, at the Arnott Forest. So, um, probably no one has heard of this species. Maybe you have. Uh, it's aconitum novoborosensei. And this is a federally threatened plant species um, that's only found in four U.S. states, and New York is one of them. So I had the, um, the, the let's say, opportunity to go to the Catskills uh, last summer and do some field work on this species. And basically what we're trying to do, we're working with U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and we're hoping by providing genomic tools, we can assess ge the diversity in the species that might help um, contribute to conservation of the species. There's also a bit of um, a lack of resolution of the phylogeny of some of these North American aconitum species, so we're doing a bit of work there to try to clarify this. Um, and this was some work that was done uh, by an intern with us this past summer. Um, so you can see on the map there where some of these uh, sessions are coming from. So we're also including Columbianum, which is found more in the west, and Unsonatum, which is found um, more in the east. So you can kind of see how things are falling out here. Um, the interesting thing was there does seem to be a strong association with the geography. Um, so where we're finding these samples um, tends to be where they're grouping together on the tree. So that was interesting. Um, so more work to be done here. I should say this is all RADSeq data that we use in a very preliminary version of the genome that um, did not incorporate the nanopore. So we'll be doing um, a bit more sampling and then running this against the, the better copy of the genome. The other thing that was kind of nice is we did flow cytometry in Novobor Sensei and um, again preliminary, but it does seem like the genome is smaller than some of the other species that we looked at, so that's kind of fortunate for us. Um, so maybe it'll be a nice reference for um, the genus. Okay, so with that, I would like to thank all the wonderful people that have worked with us. Um, of course, the Martin Lab, so Sammy and Robin, who um, are instrumental in making the DNA and the libraries. Um, also, Schatz Lab, Michael Lund for being here. Um, also, for sharing that LA 1589 data with me for our assembly. Zach Lippman. Um, all the members of the BCBC, especially Jing, um, who did uh, the, the tomato genome assemblies that I spoke about. And then all the people on the right um, have been instrumental <clears throat> in the aconitum project. And also Stacy Smith, I didn't really talk about the iachroma, but um, I'd like to thank her as well, because that's another nanopore genome that we're doing. So I'm losing my voice. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions for me? So in the introgression line, the introgression has already been created by somebody else. Yeah, so we're just using it to basically um, identify the genes that are conferring this resistance. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Do you need to...